It's just the internet, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> no one's gonna listen to us. At all. Or remember At this. All. No one's gonna remember this, yeah. That's only social media. <laughs> so let's see. <clears throat> we are live on our Google Plus page exactly at 11. So let me see right here. I'm going back. And welcome everybody to our third How to Succeed in Architecture Hangout. And today we're talking about designing for a cause with Amy Ress, Garrett Jacobs, Carl Johnson, and Katherine Darnstadt. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> this hangout is brought to you by Noveg. Noveg is the leading online software store for design professionals, from architects to engineers, from filmmakers to graphic designers. We go to great lengths to find all the software you need so you can focus on your projects. Our website offers unparalleled search and comparison charts with clear licensing information for over 8,000 products um, from over 150 brands. So visit us at noveg.com. So let's start with some introductions. Amy, I'll start with you. Um, tell us a bit about what you do. Well, first I'd like to thank Novich for hosting this <coughs> event today. It's great to be here. Um, I'm a program manager at Public Architecture. Um, I uh, lead the expansion of the 1% program, uh, pro bono design program uh, that challenges architecture and design firms uh, to make a pro bono pledge to communities in need. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, Catherine, what about you? So my name is Catherine Darnstead. Thank you for having me also. Um, I'm an architect and founder of Leighton Design. We're an architecture <coughs> firm in Chicago. And I am also an uh, educator. I teach at the School of the Art Institute and Northwestern in University here in Chicago also. And a proud member of the 1% and also former director of Architecture for Humanity Chicago. Great. Thank you, Catherine. And then we have also Carl, who's hiding there. <laughs> Here you go, Carl. So tell us a little bit about what you do. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, this is, my name's Carl Johnson. I'm the communications associate here at uh, Architecture for Humanity. So I manage things from um, you know social media to uh, blogging to a uh, bit of reporting and uh, you know our web presence in general. And I'm here with uh, Garrett Jacobs. Hello, I'm Garrett. Uh, I serve as the outreach coordinator here at Architecture for Humanity in San Francisco. Uh, that involves kind of coordinating and managing the chapter network as well as our intern program here in house in San Francisco, um, as well as a lot of our kind of uh, communications with organizations that reach out to us and pro bono services uh, like legal aid and other services that we receive. Yeah. Great. And I'm Aurora Minigallo. I'm the marketing manager here at Noveg. And behind the slides, um, who works with me is Kevin Liu here in marketing department. <coughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> so and behind the scenes, um, you don't see her, but Barbara is reading all your comments and questions on our event page on Google+. Plus. So as you're um, following this Hangout along, please um, you know, write your questions and send us comments. Um, also, just a little trivia, Architecture for Humanity is down the street from us here in Noveg, so <laughs> we are neighbors. Um, and actually, did you know that public architecture is also down the street? Really? I didn't know I that. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So we're we'll still using... You'll hear it three times. <laughs> That's right. So I'm going to start um, with my questions um, while we wait for some audience questions. So Carl, can you tell us a bit, Carl and Garrett, can you tell us a bit about Architecture for Humanity? So what does your organization do? Uh, sure. We are a nonprofit. We've been around since 1999, um, working with communities that cannot afford designs and construction services, and with uh, professional architects around the world, and and um, you know, and uh, building uh, stronger communities. Why? Why is it um, architecture for humanity um, and not architects for humanity? Um, because, uh, well, there's a lot of ways to answer that question. Because um, architecture is is kind of a means to uh, more sustainable uh, livelihoods, and uh, that usually includes a lot of other professions. Um, 
So it's a it's a very large collaborative endeavor, and that's why we don't want to be too exclusive about it. As well as when when it was originally founded, uh, Cameron Sinclair, when he chose architecture in in England, it refers to kind of the building profession as a whole. Mm. So landscape, interior designers, you know, it's those everyone was kind of clumped together in England at the time under, you know, the profession of architecture and the title of architecture. So it really is meant to be much more inclusive. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. And Amy, um, what is the One Percent Project? Well, uh, it's a uh, program. It's I'm sorry. Program. program. <laughs> um, and it's, um, it's, well, first I'd actually like to say a bit about public architecture. Uh, we're sure. we're uh, a national nonprofit. Um, and the one percent program uh, is our, our flagship program. Um, it's a an online network of architecture and design firms of the built environment that have pledged a commitment to pro bono service, and um, it offers a matching service. So uh, uh, nonprofit organizations join when they have an unmet design service need, and uh, the program facilitates uh, uh, bringing those two groups together. Great. And um, Catherine, you mentioned that you're involved with both organizations, yes, both I programs. Have been so, yeah. yeah, will you tell us a little bit about um, your experience with that? Sure, absolutely. So, Leighton Design, my architecture firm, is a member of the One Percent, and so we are committed to providing um, pro bono one percent of our pro bono services every year, and we have been a part of the One Percent since the firm was founded in 2010. And as part of that, we have also been a part of Architecture for Humanity, the Chicago chapter, and have provided and volunteered our services to lead some notable projects in the city. And so we've looked at the two different scales, like how can firms be involved, and then how can um, we as individuals be involved with the chapter. And so it's been um, really great. We've worked with Architecture for Humanity. We've been able to work with on public space projects, food access projects here with a local focus in Chicago, but then with the 1% program that has also been able to extend our reach to work on projects that might not, um, that might be at a larger scale that the chapter might not be able to take a part of. So it's been two different, two different ways to scale and look at how to incorporate social impact and pro bono into a practice. So, um, you know, a question for all of you here. Uh, what do we need these non profit programs? Um, well, I can start by saying uh, uh, our program, the 1%, is national in that uh, um, ultimately we're trying to make the largest impact on communities in need. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we made a conscious decision to work. With um, with firms rather than individuals, because we felt that um, it uh, was uh, necessary to um, to change practice to integrate pro bono um, service into practice. Mm -hmm. I think kind of going off of that, Amy, it's really it's a need for a venue. What is naturally already within the design profession of you know kind of wanting to be. Um, critical of our surroundings and other processes and then, you know, kind of helping others, you know, through those and improving those situations. And I think just putting a humanitarian or, you know, a public interest um, kind of moniker on them is really just achieving just that and giving people a venue to really access these you know, kind of desires that are latent within design in general. Well, I think that's a, from a practitioner's perspective, it's also that's at the core of why we do what we do. I mean, you're absolutely right, Garrett, that the, the design is the tool to make more sustainable communities, and we have to be able to have platforms to do that at a variety of scales. Sometimes as individuals, you might be working not be working at a firm that might not support the one percent but you as the individual can be that catalyst to, to bring that conversation into your firm if you are in a firm that is part of the one percent then it's it's great to be able to take that conversation to scale to talk about the paradigm shift that needs to happen within our practice to incorporate more of this so it, it the two the two are absolutely needed and it's so integral when in, when they work together mm -hmm. work. yeah and, and I would also just like to add that um, it's an opportunity to uh, change the, the general public's perception on the values of what design can bring to expand their capacities, to improve quality of life. 
um, and to bring relevance to the profession. So, um, how do you choose and vet the causes and organizations that you work with? And that's for all of you, you know, from the architect side, like, you know, how do you choose the, the cause that you want to be part of or the nonprofit you want to help um, through the 1% and, and for 1% um, architecture for humanity, you know, how do you choose um, the causes and, and organizations to get involved with? Um, could I actually start on that one? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, at public architecture does offer um, our, our own design practice, and we're typically choosing projects that have um, uh, that are tackling issues of the broad social relevance that we can um, begin to kind of share what we learn from those experiences and the lessons and the back best practices. But um, through our one percent program, um, uh, we're um, we're primarily just vetting nonprofit organizations through uh, their uh, tax status that they need to be 501c3 tax exempt mm -hmm. um, and leaving it up to the individual firms to uh, uh, to use uh, their standards and and how they vet clients and, and have them understand um, what values and missions are in alignment um, with uh, their goals. Um, Amy, do these organizations have to just be 501c3s or do they have to have a certain amount of budget or lack of budget or a certain amount of people working for them? You know, are there any other um, requirements um, like that? At this point, the, it is just uh, just that tax status, 501c3. Okay. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's up to the firms to do the diligence to understand if it's a good fit for them um, based on those variables, budget, timeline, uh, mission alignment, et cetera. Great. And what about Architecture for Humanity? And we, and we have a very similar process. Um, you know, we really only work with nonprofit organizations or NGOs around the globe. Um, and then, you know, also, you know, working at different scales because we have the chapter network which handles a certain type of project and then we do projects out of our headquarters here as well. So, I mean, each one kind of needs a different mark of feasibility to see if, you know, we can take them on here at headquarters and do all the project management and construction um, and send a design fellow on the ground to, to kind of manage the community uh, engagement and relationship aspect of the project. Um, so those kind of, they do need a certain amount of funding available, whereas kind of more maybe uh, domestic or local pro local projects rather, you know, they do need to be a nonprofit and um, it's also kind of a level of feasibility, you know, just kind of really getting to know the client, getting to know their level of commitment so that they understand the value of what the designer is actually bringing mm -hmm. to the table. Yeah. And then also, you know, just, just kind of setting out um, expectations at the, at the beginning, you know, kind of having that that relationship with the community partner at the beginning is very important. Yeah, and if I could add, when um, uh, we also have a uh, different set of policies when in disaster zones or disaster zones when disasters strike, uh, we um, send people out to the you know the area of the disaster and, and start doing evaluations right away. You know, meeting with communities and, and really assessing. You know the need of architecture and design services, and, and how you know how we can play a part. Um, and this usually scales up to to establishing an office like we have in Japan and Haiti. And uh, in the case of Haiti, especially, there's a lot of larger um, foundations like the the Bush Haiti Fund and stuff like that that are um, you know that are basically footing the bill for you know just you know proper architecture and construction in those areas. So. And, and there, in, the, in the case of disaster and, and uh, rebuilding, you know, there, we do tend to work with sometimes uh, private homeowners or, you know, other organizations that aren't necessarily 501c3, but it's really, you know, a vetting process through developing these personal relationships. Um, just, you know, kind of going into uh, a disaster area and um, kind of figuring out who's kind of falling between the cracks. Yeah. Um, and not necessarily, you know, getting FEMA aid or, you know, proper support from other communities, but really figuring out who's in most need because they're not, you know, receiving any attention. 
Um, so figuring out who those people are, it might not necessarily be a nonprofit, but it takes a lot of time to figure out you know, what those partners and community members are. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't quite realize you did um, so much research on the ground. That's really interesting. Um, Catherine, on your, uh, you know, as, as an architect participating in this program, like, how do you choose uh, what cause or, you know, or um, nonprofit to get involved with? That's a, that's a great question, I think. Um, as a for-profit and private firm, I mean, everybody's our client. I mean, you have to kind of look at it like that. Um, and how we choose to, to get involved is we, because of, as Amy said, the 1%, they do um, a curatorial process of who is partnering or part of the 1% program from an organizational side, and then we could select if we choose to partner with that that organization or not and donate our services to that with architecture for humanity there's such a within the chicago chapter there's such a local focus to that that many of the projects have come through networks of previous project partners and that's uh, more of individual on the ground relationships of knowing what the issues are within our our neighborhood in our city which is restoring access to a variety of things from whether it's affordable housing and, and quality education or public space and food and so that that becomes um, uh, that becomes part of the driving factor. I mean, those things of we follow the same metrics are are they a non-for-profit? Are they a community organization? What's their what's their capacity, you, you know, to be able to fully in implement and partner on a project process and then you also have um, you know, how passionate are you about it? Because, you know, there could be a great need, but when you look at what our, what are what we're going to put our firm resources to, everyone has to be passionate about it. And so I know that's totally an intangible metric, but I mean, it's, it's absolutely true. We look at who, who can bring interest and who can bring additional resources and who's going to bring the passion to implement a design solution and implement a collaborative project. And so um, you really focus on your local community, right? Yeah. You, you take yeah. this as really like helping the local community. Does yeah. does everybody in your office participate they in the? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, they not not all the time. So we give that option. So if we have either our interns or our staff, they can make that choice if they want to participate in a project or not. Because especially if we do a pro bono project, it's okay. If you know, I want to take my unpaid time to do this, or pass along those uh, to to find a pool of money um, to be available to pay for our time, but it's not okay for my staff to do it unless they choose to do it. So we've implemented a structure within our firm where we set aside 10% of our profits to go into a completely separate bank account to be able to pay and uh, and staff our pro bono projects so then that cost savings can be passed on to the client because we have to also really look at what's the best um, and most economical and financially feasible way for us to do this within a firm and also how does that get passed on to the employees that are donating their time as part of this so that's how we do it I mean always you know you always get more <laughs> you know that's the <laughs> truth of it there is always something that goes above and beyond someone who just goes um, off hours in really great and positive ways, and I'm never going to say no to that. <laughs> okay, I want to um, have a check-in here if we um, have any questions coming from the audience watching. Well, I think we're just getting warmed up right now. Um, let's, let's see. Uh, I, do I do have a question here. here. Um, do you, do you happen to? I mean, do you guys, I mean, do you guys have, to have to be an architect, architect to volunteer with architecture for humanity? I mean, is there any other ways that you you know someone could come in and volunteer their time as well? Uh, I can I can start with that at, at the chapter level. Um, no, the answer is definitely not. Uh, you do not have to be an architect or even a designer for that matter. Um, a lot of chapters really appreciate when someone has a development background or you know a graphic background or even an advertising background to really figure out how to spread the word of, of what the chapter is doing and you know what the work is uh, accomplishing. Uh, so you know really you can get involved in any level. I mean even teachers you know if if a certain chapter wanted to, to take on uh, an educational program you know it, it can really it can really be stretched to you know if you have the energy to really be involved in this you know kind of uh, developing community organizing, you know, design aspect of the profession, then, you know, you can, if you have the energy to start, you know, whatever program you want, really, it's, it's a venue for that. So, no, you don't have to be an architect. 
Uh, what but, about? Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. One percent, right? Yeah, I'm curious about, about that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, our, our our model is um, uh, working um, with firms, and so um, within a, a firm structure. Um, it's up to the uh, decision makers um, to be inclusive of their staff. They can uh, uh, pledge working with everyone on their staff if, if they have the capacity to do that. Everyone from um, administ administrative support to marketing to uh, uh, principal. Um, and so, um, you know, we see. Uh, these types of firms that if uh, if as a designer. Um, uh, your interest is to work in a firm that does social impact design, then the firms in the 1% are going to be able to deliver on that interest of yours. Um, you know, we hear a lot that designers um, are just uh, seeking how they can do meaningful work at work, and, um, and so these firms that are participating in the 1% um, uh, may be able to provide those kinds of opportunities. Um, so, like <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great um, that's a great point that getting involved with the one percent or with architecture for humanity, you know, is at work. It, it gives you that outlet that a lot of people are looking for to put their passion in their work and feeling like they're contributing to something bigger than themselves. Okay, um, let's see, uh, what kind of projects do you facilitate and work on? So are there some specs as far as how big this project, you know, it's like building a school or how, how big or small these projects are? I Who wants to, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> we're all dealing at different scales, so maybe we can all kind of address that. Um, I don't know, Catherine, maybe if you want to talk about locally, you know, what, what you're doing with latent design? Yeah, yeah, I could start with that. So, I mean, roughly speaking, uh, we have projects that have budgets from $1,000 to $10 million in the office currently right now. And so, I mean, we work at, at all the different scales. So we're looking at what is, the, what is the, the small scale temporary interventions to all the way up to large scale community master plans, new constructions. We're even working on a proposal for remediation and redevelopment for a for, former coal-powered power coal-powered coal power plant, I think that's right, <laughs> in Chicago. So, I mean, we even have the urban planning um, pieces as part of the practice. So, I think that keeps us um, very open and very nimble because uh, these types of projects and community-based projects are, are items that don't have scale and they really don't, they're not typical in any sort of way. You could even look at um, private projects that uh, do have an impact because beyond the building itself and so this is more of a, a process that we want to incorporate into our practice. One of the biggest things that we're interested in is how how did the shift happen from architecture being naturally outward facing and to having a, a, an engagement with the community, how did that start to shift and go further away where now as practitioners we only engage the community at the one or two mandatory meetings that we're required to have by the city. So how can we actually fold this more into our project process and be more external throughout it. So latent design is small. It's um, new and it's very experimental and so we look at everything from our organizational structure to, to, to manipulate and see how we make this possible from our financing to our funding to our project proposals. So and we even have things of we really believe of designing for gaps. So that's why we have that scale of project, the thousand dollar ones to the ten million ones, because you know, a gap could be a gap in public space, but you're working with an organization who has limited funds. Why walk away from that project? We could challenge ourselves to find a way to make that happen. And I think that's uh, a component of our practice that, you know, hopefully will continue to stay, to continue to grow within our profession. And what about Amy? What about the 1%? Um, well, what, what kind of projects um, will well, scale? I would say that the types of opportunities that we see coming through the 1% program are really um, uh, mirroring uh, what Catherine just shared. They range from everything from the very uh, small scopes of work, um, just helping to get a, a project off the ground through a capital campaign, all the way to new build projects um, that are maybe divided up into several phases of work. 
Um, and yeah. also, I should mention that uh, the the one percent program is is also open to. Um, all design disciplines of the built environment, so it's not just architecture, but it includes landscape architecture, interior design, structural engineering, um, and, and anyone within that category. Great. And what about you at Architecture, Garrett and, and Carl? What kind of projects, how big um, does Architecture for Humanity go? Well, uh, we go all the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, yeah. <laughs> um, all the way to planning, um, mm -hmm. which is something that we've been exploring in, in places like Haiti, and facing a lot of the, um, um, a lot of really serious housing issues, uh, really intractable, um, you know, property law issues. Um, so we kind of have to trace um, these problems to their roots and, and come up with different resources, like a like a, like a manual for Haitians to even like it start to identify and declare what plan is rightfully theirs before we can start building on it. Um, so that's in one extreme. Um, and uh, like, um, you know, informal settlement planning and, and infrastructural improvements um, uh, and things like, um, oh, what's, what's it called? Um, urban acupuncture, um, where you can make like a spot park in this. Know, informal community, but it creates an enormous impact. Um, so high impact, uh, low cost projects um, that are like that. And then you know, community centers and what. Right, and and when we have we sometimes engage projects which involve more than one building. So like our football for hope program has about 20 structures across the continent of Africa. Um, so, uh, but then at the same time, you know, our chapters engage in projects also in, in a range. Um, you know, they could do, like, our chapter in Atlanta does a yearly fundraiser, they build birdhouses and put them around the community. Um, but at the same time, mm -hmm. like, the chapter in Denver just raised uh, over $20,000 to do a project with a local um, educational facility in Denver. So it really ranges, um, as well as our chapter in... Um, Chicago? In Chicago. Well, I was going to talk about Chicago <laughs> as well. Um, DACA does, um, you know, orphanages and other large structures as well. Um, and in Chicago, you know, with, with Catherine, um, you know, doing projects like the Fresh Moves Bus, which, you know, is not necessarily a fixed structure, but, you know, kind of really addresses the issue of food deserts and access to fresh food. Um, so it's really a huge range um, and scale, as well as, um, you know, we also do a lot of programming development which is, you know, I think a really important aspect of, of what we do here at, at headquarters. Um, and the chapters are also starting to do as well, but figuring out huge issues within the industry and built environment, and then developing not just architectural solutions to them, but really designing the processes by which we can develop programs to address bigger issues. Um, so that's, that's kind of something we also focus on here. So it's not just the built environment. Great. Kevin, do you do you have a question? Well, um, I just noticed that Catherine had oh, a. Oh, let me do that again. You had a screen <laughs> share. Um, could, could, could you talk a little bit more about that, or, or you kind of you kind just, just snuck it in, like, hey, oh, check it out, guys. <laughs> 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 yeah, you like that? Um, yeah. So this is the project in Chicago that Garrett was talking about, and this is definitely one of those opportunities where we have. Uh, designers have a unique skill that extends beyond the buildings that, that can impact the built environment. And so he mentioned Fresh Moves Mobile Market. It's a mobile market inside a decommissioned CTA bus by our client Food Desert Action way back in you know late 2009-2010. And they said we have an idea for a for a mobile market to um, restore fresh produce access in food deserts, but. Like, it's an amazing idea, but we don't have anything else. And so we designed and brought in collaborators not only to design the space, but the branding, the capital campaign, and the, the website, the business cards, I mean, everything. And then so now, um, three years later, it launched in late 2011. Um, we now have three, the organization has three buses. We won an Architizer A-plus award last year for the design, a Core 77 award, a Chicago Innovation Award, and now there's three of these bright red buses roaming around Chicago and um, just recently got a grant to study the impact of mobile markets in urban environments and so when you look at that you know that is 
wonderfully not a space and it was for the team it was such an amazing opportunity not to deal with the building department so I think you know we were all excited about learning different types of codes but then also it was a model that's become highly replicated and so it's the chapter network of Architecture for Humanity has provided this opportunity to connect design teams in other cities with non-for-profit organizations that are looking to replicate that. So when you look at think of that larger network, that has been so amazing to be able to facilitate facilitate the growth of that mobile market model. Wow, I would have never that's thought cool. about that's that, cool. you know, as an architecture project was, at all. So I was going to say that was like probably, like probably the uh, uh, freshest uh, food uh, truck food ever. Truck ever. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> it's raw. So. But I do, have, I do have a question from Neil. And you guys are talking about chapters, you know, in Chicago, and you guys are all over the world, Tokyo, uh, for example. But I have a question from Neil, and he wants to know, um, there doesn't appear to be a chapter in my city, but I would like to contribute some of my time to assist. Um, as an individual, uh, how can I get involved with Architecture for Humanity uh, or Public Architecture Remote? So, thank you, Neil. Did, did he tell you his city? Did he say his city? No. Oh, yeah. Um, well, if Neil hears this, I, I think he can. Um, let us know what city you're in. <laughs> too, so yeah. <laughs> um, well, I can, I can address that because we get, you know, we get a lot of inquiries to get involved. And a lot of the time, there isn't a chapter. Um, so what, you know, we try and ask people to do is, you know, figure out if there is other interests from other designers. And maybe they can, you know, hop on the 1% website and see if there is additional interest. Um, you know, and either gauge interest in their own offices to then, you know, join the 1% or, you know, find other individuals that may be interested in starting a chapter and addressing local issues. Um, you know, it's, it's just kind of difficult because if we don't have, you know, specific projects in different regions, it's, you know, it's, you kind of have to be the identifier. You know, and I think this is a strong thing um, that we can start doing is, you know, figuring out how we can identify issues as well, you know, and, and starting to find projects. So, you know, it really is kind of up to you to, to kickstart this process. Um, you know, and, you know, we're always working on new programs to get more people involved, but really, you know, it's, you have the energy to, to kind of kickstart this process in your local area. And I would like to just say uh, I agree completely with Garrett. Um, and uh, public architecture and our 1% program um, at the moment is limited just to working uh, within the U.S. Uh, we are looking at ways that we can expand uh, uh, beyond uh, this country, but um, in the meantime, I think uh, there's so much to do that um, you know designers can be proactive in looking at the challenges of their own communities and uh, identifying uh, projects and uh, be taking a leadership role in um, improving their communities great um, so we'll wait to see if Neil tells us what city is from uh, <laughs> is <in> right now <laughs> see if we have more specific advice as well but what I'm hearing is be a leader you know take initiative and and uh, find a way to get involved and it's very possible um, so one thing I oh I see okay Kevin here just uh, Skype me that he has another question well um, <laughs> just to let everybody know Neil is in Victoria British Columbia so um, also oh. known as Canada, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, but I do have a question from Ushba. Uh, well, wait, wait. Uh, so he's in. Uh, wait a second. He's in British Columbia, in Canada. Okay. Oh, he just told us that there is a Vancouver chapter of uh, Architecture okay. for Humanity, uh, <laughs> but he can likely make it to Portland, Oregon. So um, I love Portland. So yeah. Oh, that's great. There, How about the one percent? Is the one percent in Canada? Um, we have a handful of uh, firm participants and um, uh, we kind of uh, informally welcome uh, uh, design firms to join the program though unfortunately we can't offer a matching service um, mm. uh, we don't yet have the on the ground kind of expertise in um, uh, in the nonprofit community to add, but that's something that we're also exploring great so back to you Kevin with a new question Cool. Um, okay, so you know, you guys have budgets from a thousand dollars and so on. Um, what ways have you guys uh, worked with uh, low cost materials? Um, have there been any low cost materials that you guys been uh, developed or synthesized, which will help most projects, which are usually low cost for cost? So thank you, Ushba. Material wise, I guess, yeah, just technical question. 
<laughs> uh, well, it, it, it really depends on, on where you find yourself. I think, um, yeah, it, it really depends. I think um, we do have a couple of projects, especially in Africa, that we're able to use site source and press with block, which is, I think, as low cost as it gets. Um, but, you know, it's it, it's really on a case by case basis because of course that deals with soils or you know what resources are available. Uh, working in places like Haiti or or even Japan post disaster, there's a huge issue of scarcity. So um, I mean the the, the situation is completely different. And then as well locally, and maybe Catherine, you can address this as well. But you know a lot of the chapters get um, you know kind of in in kind donations for materials mm -hmm. and are able to source that locally. You know kind of in return for both. Uh, tax deductions as well as kind of a, a mm. partnership on an organizational level. Yeah, I mean, so when you look at that from the chapter level, there's low-cost materials from from being able to develop different material options, and then there's just being able to leverage your your budget <laughs> to do more than it, it is originally intended to do. The other thing that we work on within latent design is how do we actually shift policy to allow for different types of materials to be used, especially when we look at our spontaneous interventions and our public space initiatives. So we have one that went up um, a couple weekends ago where we activated a Department of Transportation public space, a plaza that was just all concrete, and we had all of these discussions with them because it was we were creating an active play space on the ground via paint. Um, I can do a screen share and I can show you what that will look like. So I'm warning you, I'm doing a screen share. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's working, so, it's working beautifully. Okay. So this was one of the, um, this was the, uh, the concept of the design that was going on the space and it was just paint and we had this long discussion with the city of you know, can we do this? Can we leverage our volunteer labor? And they were saying, no, we needed general contractors to paint the ground. And so that's where we have to start to really leverage and look at, you know, and talk to our municipal partners and talk to policymakers to talk about what are various types of installation and means and methods that could go into creating um, wonderful spaces. And so it's all of these different layers and levels that we need to, to really work at from developing low-cost materials to even talking to people about the availability of low-cost materials and then making that part of a, an approved project process. You know, what I'm, what I'm hearing that's really interesting to me is how much you get involved with the community and also, um, and, and you're mentioning now, you know, get involved in, in um, meetings and in, with organization and, and the um, city council and everybody that has a say in uh, laws and regulations that affect you and your practice. Do you want to talk about a little bit more about what are the things that people can do to sort of not just volunteer but also get more involved in their community? Ab I'll, I'll, can I kick this off? I'm sorry. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's not even being involved uh, with organizations, which these are two amazing organizations to be involved with, and there might even be a, a greater um, diversity of organizations at your local level. But getting involved in policy and community meetings is so important because there are people making decisions about our built environment who have no background in design or the built environment. And so that's where we need to start to be able to act as design consultants and share our expertise with um, within our communities because by the time you know specifically for architects or and planners by the time some of these projects get to our desks that we get to work on them so many decisions that impact the project either positively or negatively have already been made and we're left questioning like who the hell made that decision well it's a person <laughs> who doesn't know any architects because we're just not there a great example of that is we were a consultant on the 20-year cultural plan for the city of Chicago last year and we were the only architects and they're dealing with space issues, place issues, zoning issues and there were no architects as part of that and I ended up there kind of randomly involved in it because we were working on art space, an art zone, an art project um, to create a creative arts incubator and we just happened to be in that circle at that same time and then when we found out nobody else was talking and advising about space issues. We said, well, can we, you know, we're willing to put this time forward because this is a, you're planning 20 years of space <laughs> for the city. And if you're not talking to anyone who knows about it, you know, we're not the experts, but we certainly can contribute a lot of information about this and maybe help guide policy and planning and future funding for projects. And I think part of that yeah. is, you know, I, I mean, awesome points, Catherine. I, I just, you know, I think we can hold the architectural and design education accountable for a lot of that in some ways because, you know, it's very pigeonholed and, you know, 
kind of a lot of these issues on how to tie the profession back into the community are not addressed. You know, even, even schools that are doing really amazing work in terms of community engagement don't really get students involved, you know, I mean, they can, but the majority don't really get students involved in, you know, planning processes, in policy issues, and don't encourage it really at all. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it's, you know, kind of, tra it's about training people correctly, you're not correctly, but, you know, appropriately and uh, applicably as well. And that's something that, you know, some schools are starting to address, but, you know, definitely we're just at the cusp of starting to do that. And that's that's another thing that we could do, you know, within the educational realm as well, to prepare people to be advocates for what we're doing. Amy, do you want to add anything to this? Um, well, I think uh, I, I've um, agreed with both the points of Garrett and Catherine, and I think uh, you know it's a matter of being civically engaged and to care um, about what's going on in your community and finding the ways, whether it's through attending community meetings or um, joining the board of a, a nonprofit that you believe in. Um, and, and, and frankly, just getting to know your neighbors um, uh -huh. uh, does a lot too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think we have one more question here from our audience. That's right. Uh, we have a question from Andres, um, and Andres wants to know, um, do any of you guys have experience with projects that start out as a nonprofit in order to prove its concept and market value so that it can then enter the for-profit sector? I know, right? Uh, yeah. So I think what they so might mean here is that um, they're concerned that some of the projects might start in non-profits, but really... Um, you know, the aim is to develop something that is profitable or that it will become profitable. And it might go back to how you screen these organizations or these projects. Or if you've ever had a situation where you found out, you know, hmm, this is a little bit. So if you had any bad experience, essentially. <laughs> uh, sorry, I was, I was live tweeting. <laughs> um, is it, does anyone else want to go first? I'll I think you might, be, you might have the most lot of experience with that. Oh, yeah, I mean, okay, so <laughs> one more time, what's the question? I think, um, you know, if, if there are um, a 501c3 nonprofit that um, even if it is in, um, eventually going to become a, a, a money generating organization, that it uh, hopefully is being reinvested in their mission and the expansion of their program um, and uh, I, I think that that's uh, potentially one trigger um, that hopefully would would catch and um, you know I think uh, as you as designers are vetting uh, pro bono projects to take on they should be looking at the organization's uh, uh, past tax history um, their past fundraising ability um, um, they can do reference checks. Um, you know, all those things are very important when vetting a, a pro bono client. Yeah. But it's, we, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you can look at, because um, I've had tons of bad experiences, but I'm still here anyway. I mean, so <laughs> it's all part of a learning process. And, you know, we really look at how we, we structure our contracts. So we know on pro bono or for profit projects whether or not we're creating into intellectual capital and um, for our client. And so we have clauses within our contracts that, if, especially if it's a pro bono client or a nonprofit, that they're only going to use this for that non for profit. That even anyone mm -hmm. on the board can't take those ideas and move off to, like, if it's a great idea, they can't move off and put that in the private realm. So we try mm -hmm. and, you know, if you tell lawyers what you don't want to be done, they'll find a way to figure out a clause to put in your contract, and you can really start to, to amend that and, and start to, 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 to frame how that project is going to run and move forward. So what I'm hearing is that, um, you know, don't worry too much about this. I, I don't hear anybody here had a, a crazy nightmare scenario and that there are ways to protect yourself and to do research and also to protect yourself legally. Uh, and make sure that your volunteer work is not um, taken, you know, your time is not taken advantage of. So I really like that you were sharing some, um, you know, uh, images from uh, some of your projects. Um, and I was wondering who else has a cool project to show us and talk about. 
Um, well, uh, I, I could um, set up my screen share and <laughs> talk about one of the projects that comes out of the 1%. Great. Uh, we'll give you there like a few seconds yeah, <laughs> to get this. <laughs> no problem, yeah. Um, okay, I see you're ready. There we go. Okay, and uh, let's see, let me just do that. Is that working now? Yes, it looks great. So this is um, uh, a project of, of, of Planned Parenthood partnership with a, a firm called Pujeron Architecture. Um, and um, uh, Anne Fugeron, the uh, principal of the firm, has had a 20-year um, partnership with this organization. Um, and she's warmly called their agency architect. Um, uh, and so um, some of the work that they've done um, you know, over this 20-year period has been reduced fee, but a lot of it has been pro bono. Um, and it's a relationship that first introduced the firm to healthcare design, and now it's one of the strongest areas of their practice. Um, it's also um, an inspiring story of how uh, pro bono work can uh, to lead to uh, large-scale impact um, affecting the lives of thousands of people. And um, so this is kind of a, uh, uh, the showing the exponential uh, trajectory of, of just one pro bono relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it started with, um, uh, um, back in the 1990s when there was a shooting and um, uh, in one of these clinics and four people were um, shot dead, including a doctor and uh, a volunteer and a security guard. And so um, the architect and Pujron, uh, believing in their mission, started volunteering at a local um, uh, clinic. And they learned that she was an architect. And so in their desperate need for kind of security <laughs> improvements, um, they, had, they began working together. And uh, you know, she not only you know, uh, designed you know, using materials like bulletproof glass, but she created a real dignified space. Um, and uh, uh, created a, a palette that they could use in, uh, of materials and colors um, throughout all of their clinics. And um, she worked; uh, she's worked on over 14 um, different facilities. And those facilities now serve as a model for clinics across the country. And so, you know, some of uh, the clients of Planned Parenthood just, you know, they can't believe the space is designed for them. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, provides a dignity and respect, um, and it's opened up access to health care, um, you know, to thousands of people. So what I hear also is that it was a great way, <coughs> excuse me, for these architects to get involved in a new, um, in a new field, so particularly health care field that they weren't so familiar with. That's right, and so it can, um, pro bono work can be a, a, a method for expanding your market um, uh, to, to build a portfolio in an area that, um, that you don't have experience in. So, um, Garen and Carl, do you have a, a project to share with us? Yeah, I mean, kind of working on the same idea of safety, you know, we're, we're, we're still trying to how to develop the metrics by which to assess the success of projects such as these. And I think that, you know, safety is definitely one, you know, one of the rates that we can really clearly mark success of a project. And, and the projects for the Football for Hope program that we're doing in Africa is, you know, they're all football, they're football pitches in communities that you know, might have um, some, you know, high levels of crime. And, and what we've been finding is that now that a lot of the centers are complete that you know they're both reducing crime rates and providing places for communities to gather but um, you know one of the projects that I like to focus on or Carl go more in depth about the actual project is um, one of the centers where we focus mostly on you know really trying to empower community members by training them in the building techniques that we use so Carl can go into a little more detail about that uh, right right so um, the uh, this town is it's called Monica, it's in Mozambique. Um, this is in a very remote area. Um, and you're looking at, uh, I, uh, we mentioned this earlier, um, this is one of the compressed earth blocks that, um, uh, that was developed uh, you know, in, you know, from the site with, with the community. Um, 
you know, by our, our two Portuguese design fellows that had kind of transformed a master's thesis into, into this project. I and mean, it was just a perfect match for the community that we were building with the soil conditions. Here they are testing the bricks. And they established a training program with a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, otherwise, uh, you know, un unskilled builders in the ways of Press earth block, uh, block. It's a you know it was a new technology to the area. So they um, so these design fellows essentially introduced uh, a new technology and a way to to make architecture there. So that's that's the groundbreaking. Here's um, here's some training sessions. Um, you know, working with these arches and um, <laughs> that's uh, that's a that's a wet day on site. Uh, <laughs> and so it takes a lot of. Uh, I'm so is this the local population or a local company helping yeah, out and part uh, of the project? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so at the end of the project, what we have are, are these builders that are now certified. Anyway, they're now certified in, in doing this new construction technique. Um, and uh, um, they've got a complete building under their belts, and they can they can move on to another project. So you know that's like a best case scenario for us is when you know the the act of architecture kind of you know engenders more architecture or you know more construction, stronger local economies. All that stuff is is within the realm of what architecture can accomplish in and but also just, community. Yeah, but also just empowered individuals. Like so, yeah. so any one of these you know people can go and essentially start their own business because they bring a new technology, knowledge, and process to their community. So you know it's it's hopefully going to spur more economic development in the area as well as provide more jobs in the long run. So I mean, these these are all aspects and huge values of design that we don't talk about as designers. So I just really love this project for you know the success of, of really broadening the reach of what architecture can do and doing it a very visible, measurable manner. So not only um, y you, c you built a new building, but also there was training and there's economic development and all these other um, consequences of your work. Correct, exactly. Um, yep. Great. Um, should we wait here for some more slides or are you, are you switching back to yourself or do you have another uh, yeah. project? Yeah, just, just this one. Everyone got their certificates. So okay. I, I strongly <laughs> encourage. This is really cool. Um, jaw dropping stuff. Would you be able to share this link maybe on our event page? I think that'll be awesome. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Totally. Cool. Great. I think Catherine has something up too because um, she turned into a browser. I turned into a browser. Yeah, I did. So uh, I know. I know. I'll try and wrap this up because I know we're running low on time, but one of the projects is actually what our first 1% project, and I still have no idea how this actually happened. I mean, Linton Design was formed, and then about two months later, we got a call from this organization who wanted us to, do, to help them program and, and kick off a capital campaign for a new construction community center that we're working on. And so the 1% ask um, with this organization was to help with programming, um, programming in some of those really the, the, the expectation management phase is what I really called it, which it ha happens way before concept design. And so it was, we gave ourselves this latitude to really look at programming through a community and participatory lens. And working with the organization, they wanted uh, a new construction community center that was about 50,000 square feet at that time. It's now 30,000 square feet. And when we got into the conversation of what, um, what they need in the space, um, they asked for also for science labs. Um, and I asked what science really looks like to them. And it's, uh, they answered that science labs are very much Bunsen burners and lab coats. And, you know, that's not how I view science at all. And I remarked that we're building them, you know, a, a gigantic science lab. You know, let's talk about building science, let's talk about all these things. And they're an organization that provides services to young women, predominantly African American, 12 through 18, on the far south side of Chicago. And they are working in some of the roughest neighborhoods in the city and with one of, one of the most um, 
notorious school, Spenger High School, is where some of the girls come, where a couple years prior, a young boy, Darian Albert, was beat to death by a two by four. And so we have this culture of violence on the south side, and they are providing this safe space, and that's what they wanted the building to be. And so how can we make a building not only a community redevelopment tool, but also a giant science lab? It's from that programming conversation that we had with them, we ultimately developed a program for the organization, an academic curriculum for the organization that became a Building Hero program. So how do we bring the young women that they're working with, how do we um, get them to be more integrated into STEM careers? And how do they? we also get them to become small scale community redevelopers themselves and also give them the opportunity to work with power tools because why not? Um, and so with this, this became a challenge to create a program that would work for the organization for their new goals, which is not only providing um, enhanced after school curriculum for young women, but also become community redevelopers themselves at a variety of scale. They're doing it at the building scale, and then they wanted to be able to do that and instill that with the young women that they serve. And then for us as, a, as, a, as late in design, it was how do we get more women into our profession that are minorities? You know, and so if I'm going to be challenging that myself, I'm not going to give them a Barbie doll. I'm going to give them a hammer, and that's exactly what we did. I mean, it, like I said, Roseland with that culture of violence, we had, we we launched the design build program last year, and we had um, about a, over a hundred news articles come out about the neighborhood of Roseland, and there were only two positive ones, and they were about the program that we did here. So during two weeks' time, the young girls went through human-centered design strategies, learned how to engage the community, learned how to, you know, in, use building materials, what they were, um, sometimes got overly ambitious about what they could carry, and there are so many um, huge metaphors that come with that, that ultimately they designed and constructed a vacant space between two buildings and conceptually came up with the idea that that what the neighborhood needed was a safe space and so they ultimately created you know this concept of Switzerland in Chicago which was you look at this image you have something that is um, that is the rope mountains rope mountains um, becoming ropes tied together becoming mountains you have the blue which is the stream you have grassy plains in the beginning um, and then uh, this was done all in a two-week time and so what you start to have is not only this small-scale transformation of a space but then a transformation of what's possible with individuals and also what the the change in the community perception of space and the roles and you know the roles of individuals in a community and we found during those two weeks that people were spontaneously contributing their time and were just interested and that was something that we couldn't have planned at all and so now that was one piece that now we're we're doing that's an annual curriculum piece for the organization and this is the building that we're ultimately renovating it what you see is a historic Chicago firehouse um, in the in the Pullman neighborhood which if you're familiar with Chicago history the Pullman porters and the Pullman neighborhood was created by Pullman himself who you know you might be familiar with Pullman porters and the Pullman cars itself so revolutionized revolutionizing the train industry and transportation industry itself and this is also a very historic piece of african-american culture so the organization is taking the risk and buying this um, firehouse from the city it's owned by the city currently and going to transform that and then there's that adjacent parcel of land next to the building and so that's also where we're going to do a new construction um, building adjacent to that and so this is just a transformation of a program that I don't think if, if they came to us without the one percent. I don't think first we wouldn't have connected. It was absolutely because of the one percent program that we connected with this client and built a relationship with them. That ultimately we have several projects in that neighborhood um, now that we're working on at a variety of scales. And you know, the one percent gave us this latitude to really rethink what our role could be. And that's we've had that. That was something that was very interesting. And also, I think when we when I've worked on Architecture for Humanity project, that also gives us the latitude to rethink what our roles could be. Because somehow, it's it's wonderful to think about what you can contribute outside of 
maybe sometimes the the parameters we put up for our own firms or for our own profession and just really be free and, and trying to address the problems in the most effective way possible. And so, you know, they've talked about um, different industry sectors and they talked about the um, being able to contribute to this desire to give back. But I think the other thing that these organizations do is give us the flexibility to really get at, to, to design solutions for core issues and the core problem that, you know, that, that we allow ourselves to not only be architects, but we could actually be the humans first that have this wonderful skill of design and that just changes the whole entire conversation. That's, that's really great and very inspiring to see all these projects <laughs> and to hear all the passion behind them as well. Yeah. And um, I have to start wrapping this up because we're, we're going to be going over a little bit. Um, so before I ask you for your last words and all that kind of stuff, um, I have one question, which is, um, I'm sorry, I should switch my screen to me. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, you know, so many of the people that are watching um, this now have small firms and, and they probably feel like uh, they might be struggling to, you know, make as much money as they want or to get their uh, business off the ground or to grow as much as they want with their architectural firm. And so, um, and this is a question specifically, I think, for Catherine. It's like, how you know, do you work in this nonprofit work with your uh, for-profit work, and how did this help, um, if any, to sort of um, you know move your career along and your business along? Yeah, I mean, I definitely started late in design in a in a very strange way, and I won't get into how that came to be. Um, but I think this is absolutely an industry sector and a, a part of our field that I want to be in. I mean, if I have the, if I can make the mission for my own firm, I'm going to make it what I want it to be, and that's the fact. And I will make it work. I mean, we are profitable. We have, we've had rough years. We've had rough months. Hell, you have rough days. But <laughs> you just, you keep moving it forward and find what works for you. And I don't think working with non for profits or community organizations has adversely affected our business. It's been, you know, we have to, we have to figure out how we can always keep that a part of our organization and keep it a part of what our firm does and who we want our client base to be. Because I think it's a big misconception that somehow non for profits always don't have money. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they do. There are, there are projects that come from that. But, um, I think you have to, to find a way to incorporate it into your practice and it, you know it doesn't necessarily have to be 100% of your practice, it could be a small portion of it also and that's why you have these opportunities of scale and that's what you see our firm does is work at a variety of different scales. And we also work in collaboration with other organizations. So we're never taking on the full load um, on our own. So we're never working on a pro bono project by ourselves. It's always in collaboration with other organizations and other individuals. And that helps create not only an, an enhanced and amplified impact, but it also allows us to um, be more efficient with the way that we work. So um, before I uh, wrap this up, I want to check if there are any more questions from the audience. Uh, in fact, we do. Um, so we've seen everything that you guys worked on, that you guys participated in, um, you know, the compressed brick and the uh, Switzerland and Chicago. Uh, so I have a question for, um, I think I want to start off with Amy too. Um, so what, this is from Arvin, from uh, one of our uh, viewers. and. He's wondering, what steps do you take to expose students of architecture to humanitarian design uh, so this shift in the profession is brought to education? Uh, do you guys engage students in developing countries as well, where architects are still almost exclusively trained for mainstream for-profit work that ignores the local realities? So take it away. Amy, would you like to start? OK. Well, um, we have uh, several uh, different ways that we tap into the educational system. Um, uh, first, in, uh, we're, we're, we have a, a formal partnership with the AIA, um, which involves, um, uh, you know, working their work with students, and, and um, the AIA has has made a commitment to. Uh, to direct their membership to the 1% program as the uh, platform for pro bono service. Um, and uh, we also, as a firm, um, uh, we do things like we have an, um, an 
an annual summer internship program where we bring students into our office so they can um, contribute to the work and initiatives uh, uh, that we take on. Um, and we've also done um, some uh, collaborations with different universities like this summer we're working with the University of Texas at Austin um, in their public interest design summer program. Um, and I'm um, actually headed uh, tomorrow to uh, work with a group of extern externs that are doing post-occupancy evaluations of uh, some social services facilities in Austin. And then I think uh, with AFH, we, you know, um, we travel and uh, members of the office uh, lecture to universities all over the world as well as um, you know, doing programs like Students Rebuild, where we actually get students involved in the community engagement process. Um, you know, we did a lot of that in Haiti and in Japan as well. Um, we just recently did a, a competition called Guerrilla Green Sustainability Showdown, where, you know, we got high school students all over the country to kind of hack their schools green in a more sustainable way. So, you know, kind of even going to the high school level before, you know, the university setting, where it gets a little more formalized. Um, and then also, you know, we invite people year-round to, to have volunteer uh, internships at our headquarters as well. This past summer, we had 13 people here that worked for three to six months, you know, most of them students or grad students, really getting involved in, you know, program creation and, you know, just really helping out the uh, office culture, you know, and, and just really learning as much as they can about the organization and how we function. So really trying to do a lot more outreach. You know, a lot of, some, there's one issue with universities and, and community design is that it's hard because university students leave a lot of the time. So, you know, how do you want to show that you're really invested in a community when you have a lot of people leaving afterwards? But I don't know, maybe that can change. But there's a, a lot of, there's still so many opportunities out there to engage in uh, university settings. <laughs> Great. Kevin, do you have any more questions there? No, I'm good. Um, go, go for it. it. Okay, so I want to invite you all then to give us your last words, uh, you know, on uh, how can people join your organization and why should people join and uh, any last word of advice before we end this Google Hangout? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first or should I volunteer one of you? <laughs> Well, I well, think it's a matter yeah. that we don't want this great conversation to end. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I, know. I, I hope that um, through uh, this uh, small community uh, in this conversation that um, uh, that we've showed the opportunities um, to get involved and um, you know, it just is a simple step. Uh, joining the one percent program, for example, is just it takes about five minutes and um, and. Um, at your fingertips are, are project opportunities um, and resources to support your work. Um, and, and actually, uh, I'd like to share the different ways that um, uh, please you can um, uh, there get involved with public architecture. Um, um, you know, I encourage everyone to to reach out with the uh, you know outside of this. Um, event with uh, questions and, and you know uh, it's been such a pleasure to be in this conversation. Thank yeah, you Amy. I, I agree I just think you know continuing continuing the conversation really, you know really encouraging that local leadership on every level and I think you know getting involved in both organizations at the local level I think Catherine you know is really you know can speak to the success of, of doing that um, but just Staying involved and really challenging your local community around you, and never stop, you know, kind of asking questions about what you can do, just jumping in. And how can people um, join Architecture for Humanity or volunteer um, with your organization? Uh, people can join the chapter network, and it's just at chapters.architectureforhumanity.org. Um, you know, to see if there's a local chapter around them, or you know, help start a local chapter. Uh, they can also come here for volunteer opportunities at our headquarters, um, and just keep keep posted. You know, we have design fellowships that pop up, and just, just keep in contact. 
And just because we didn't say um, at the beginning, the the national headquarters is here in San Francisco, Novaggi is headquarters in San Francisco, and uh, Architecture for Humanity is just down the street, and so it's the 1%, as I <laughs> found out today. <laughs> so you know guys. your dress. <laughs> That's right. Okay, now from Chicago, Catherine, your last word of advice. Yeah, I mean... And why join? You can't, you, you can't join me. Um, <laughs> the same sense as everyone else. Um, but I think you can join within this, this same movement. I mean, I'm a big proponent of alternative forms of education. And so really taking um, control of how you want the design community and how you want your architecture and your built environment to act. So it's really from... Um, emerging professional students and practitioners of, of all levels of experience of really crafting what they want, um, how they want architecture and design to define the context so we can start to better design the context of our spaces and places within um, our world. And so for me, um, it's taken control of it. I mean, we have an amazing power as designers to be able to um, make wonderful spaces and safe spaces for individuals at all scales. So we can we can do that. Um, if you want to know more, I, you can find our website. Of course, um, it's LeightonDesign.net. Always remember the net, or else you get um, a wonderful photographer site. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then also, where you could find us on Facebook. Find me a lot on Twitter um, at Leighton Design. Leighton underscore Design is my Twitter handle over there. And and um, at various other places. If you're in Chicago, you could. I'm pretty sure you could find me if you ever come to Chicago and everyone's more than welcome to always visit. <laughs> so we can take you out for lunch too if we're in Chicago. <laughs> Yes, you can always take me out for lunch in Chicago. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. I want to thank everybody, Amy, Carl, Catherine, Garrett, and also Kevin right here that's hiding again uh, behind the slides, and Barbara behind the scenes here at Noveg. Um, you can find Noveg as well. Um, thank you for attending. And you know, if you have feedback, you can email me at auroranoveg.com, and you can find Noveg um, online as well. We're on Twitter and Facebook and, of course, Google Plus if you're watching this. And uh, so next month, we're going to have a whole new Hangout. I'll make the announcement soon. And until then, thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of the week. I'm going to end. Thank you. Bye. 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 I'm going to end the broadcast now.